Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Kenneth, for helping them out. That worship team looked a lot better today than they had in a long time. Amen. <laughs> it is good to have you here today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the New Testament, to the book of Philemon. Uh, we were there last Sunday, and we're going to finish up there this morning. Uh, in the book of Philemon, and if you're turning or looking for that, it's a small book in the New Testament, located to the left of Hebrews. Uh, so as you're working there, just as a little background, last week we talked about the motivation of grace. You know, there's something about God's grace that can motivate us to do things that are out of our character, out of our nature. And we looked last week that grace motivates our fellowship, how we interact with each other. Grace motivate, motivates our faithfulness. You know, when we understand and realize what God has truly done for us, it compels us out of love to serve Him even more. And then last of all, last week, we talked about grace and how it motivates forgiveness. I think that we would all agree that sometimes forgiving others it's one of the hardest things we can do as a Christian. Would you agree with that? Amen. It really is. It's just like the devil just loves to play with that in our minds. And But we look at that and we're going to kind of pick up on the end of that today. But I read a very interesting story uh, this week about uh, a young lady. Her and her parents were missionaries in the Philippines. And right after... Uh, the attack of the Japanese on Pearl Harbor. Actually, I believe it was about eight to ten hours after they attacked Pearl Harbor, there was an attack on the Philippine Islands. And her, mission, her family was there as missionaries in the Philippines to minister to the Japanese people that lived there. Not only the Filipinos, but also the Japanese. And once they heard of what was taking place, uh, it did not say how that they were separated, but the parents had left, and they fled with the family, with their daughter, up into the mountains in a, in a remote region. But during that time, the parents were captured uh, by the Japanese. And it was felt that the parents were spies, according to the Japanese. Uh, we're not for sure where the daughter was at that time. She, we're just assuming she got away where she would, was with friends. and uh, They took her somewhere else after the parents uh, had been captured. And then, uh, needless to say, as the, the parents were tried, they were sentenced to execution. And they were killed. Their daughter learned about her parents' death and she was filled with anger, hurt, disappointment, but God began to break her heart. She was reminded of her parents' selfless love for the Japanese people. During her prayer time, she became convinced that her parents had forgiven the very ones that God had called them to love and serve and who also became their execution. Peggy decided rather, to live, rather than to live with bitterness and hatred, she actually chose to forgive. One of the ministries that God opened up for her is that in one of the islands at the Phil in the Philippines, it was a POW camp for Japanese prisoners. Here this lady, young lady, maybe 19 or 20, after her parents had been executed, she went every day to minister, to love, and to share about the love of Christ to the Japanese prisoners every single day. That's what love and forgiveness can do. That's what grace motivates us to accomplish in our everyday life. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I don't know where you're at in your spiritual walk, but I know this, I know that God loves you and God desires for you to be in an open and obedient relationship with Him. Today, God has great plans for you, a great purpose. Will you allow God to fulfill that purpose in your life? Father, today, we're so thankful for your grace and your love. We ask you, Father, that you will help us to be open and submissive unto your spirit. 
Speak to us today through your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we finish up today, the motivation of grace, we're going to begin in verse 20 of the book of Philemon. And of course, there's no really chapter in the book of Philemon. There's just 25 verses. So uh, we're going to pick up in verse 20, and we're going to see that grace, one of the things that grace does is that it motivates our character. Verse 20 says this. Remember, this is Paul writing to Philemon. You know the story of Philemon. We went over it last week. He was actually a, a, a very prominent individual in the church, a very a servant for Christ, and at that point in time in the culture, uh, he actually was a slave owner. One of his slave owners actually robbed him and took off. And he thought he was going to go to Rome and kind of mix in with all the people that lived in Rome. Well, God had a different plan. The slave's name was Onesimus. And of all the people that he could have ran into, God allowed his path to cross with the Apostle Paul. Now we know that's just not coincidence, but that is a divine appointment of how God works in our lives even when we don't realize it. God had brought those two together and we understand that through the Scripture that uh, grace was demonstrated to Onesimus. He became a follower of Christ. And now Paul is writing Philemon, his former owner, and he is asking him to forgive Onesimus. And actually, he not only said that earlier in the Scripture, he said, listen, Philemon, if there is any debt occurred by him, put it on my king and I will pay everything in full. What a wonderful picture of God's grace because we all know that there's a debt that we cannot pay on our own. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, He allowed us the gift of salvation. But here we see in verse 20, it says, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Grace motivates our character. And when we are walking and uh, in an obedient relationship with Christ, one of the things we do, we're able to rejoice in how God is working, not only in our lives, but also in the lives around us. <clears throat> Scripture says, let me have joy of thee. You know, Paul, whenever he thought of Philemon, it would just brought joy to his heart. Think about this question. When others think about you, when other people think about you, your name crosses their mind, whether it's someone at work, in a community, at church, you know, no matter where you're at during the week, somebody thinks about you at some point. Does the thought of joy come to their heart when they think of you? Think about that. Do they think of joy when they think of you? Part of our character is that we are to be able to rejoice in what God has called us to be, but also to rejoice in what God is doing in others. And also, Paul went on to say in verse 20, refresh my bowels in the Lord. Now, if you remember last week, we, we talked about this. We don't usually use this type of phrasing in our, in our daily language, do we? You know, we've done this last week. Look at your neighbors and say, hey, you know, my bowels are refreshed by seeing you today. That's not what it's talking about. You know, we, we just don't use that type of language. What it's talking about is our heart is so filled with joy. Our heart is rejuvenated. Everything about us is refreshed and renewed. That's part of the character of how grace motivates us. It's amazing. What God can do. Our hearts are overwhelmed by what God is doing in your life. Can that be said about you? Can that be said about me? Grace motivates our character, but not only that, grace motivates our confidence. Verse 21 says this, Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Whenever we have confidence in God, it provides the ability for us to do the right thing. Sometimes it is hard to do the right thing, is it not? How many of us have been hurt by someone before? They've said something, they've done something, they've touched you in the back, 
They, I mean, they kind of pulled the rug out from under you for a promotion at work. Someone in your family, whoever it may be, a close friend, but they have hurt you and hurt you severely. We within our own strength cannot forgive. We cannot do that. But Paul says, I have confidence in thy obedience. The reason that Paul had confidence was not necessarily in Philemon's ability itself, but his obedience to God. That is the one who gives us the ability. ability. Confident that God would provide him the strength to do what was needed. It's hard to be obedient at times, isn't it? It's hard to be obedient to what God calls us to do. But yet, grace motivates us to be confident. Also, Paul says at the end that thou wilt also do more than I say. In other words, Philemon, I trust you're going to go the extra mile. It's easy to go the extra mile for those we like, isn't it? For those you love, for those you hang out with during the week. For those that you have a good, solid relationship with, it's easy to go the extra mile if they need help or if there's something going on in their life. You would never think twice about it. But for those that have hurt us, sometimes it's hard to go the extra mile. And Paul says, Philemon, listen, because of what God has done in your life, I have faith and confidence that not only are you going to be obedient to God, but you're going to go the extra mile and do whatever is necessary to meet the needs of Onesimus. Verse 22 says, But withal prepare me also lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Now, this is kind of a subtle way that Paul says there's going to be some accountability. Paul says, not only do you need to do this with Onesimus, but you need to go ahead and get a room ready because I'm going to be coming and checking in on you and see how this goes. You see, there's a misconception in American Christianity that says we can live however we want to without any accountability. Folks, do you know we're accountable? We're accountable to God. We're accountable to each other. We're accountable, whether we like to admit it or not, we're accountable under the leadership how God has set up the church. There's accountability in place. And we may not like it, but all of us are accountable under what God's Word says. You know, a lot of times people come to me and they've got issues and they've got problems and one of the best responses I have is let's see what God's Word has to say about it because it's not my opinion and it's not your opinion, but let's see what God's opinion is. And you can tell the person's heart and their nature by how they respond to what God says. You can tell. Now there's been times when people pulled me to the side and said, Mike, now listen, you know, I didn't like it. We've all been there, have we not? You know, whenever we were taught as children, you don't go and touch a stove. The top of the stove. Whether it's on or not, as kids, they really don't know at times. But what did your parents do? They wanted to protect the children from burning themselves. It's the same way with God. He puts people in our lives and He gives us His Word to help us from burning ourselves, from hurting ourselves. Grace motivates our character. It motivates our confidence. And last of all this morning, it motivates our commitment. Paul begins to list some names of individuals. And honestly, most of the time, when we read this book, or sometimes Paul may list other names, we just kind of read through them and go on. And I'm the only one that's ever done that. I mean, you just kind of, I mean, you read them, but you go on. We don't really stop and look at what he's saying. We know we think there's something else coming and we just kind of move on. Well, I want us to stop for just a minute and we see that Paul lists some individuals that Philemon would know and by doing this, he's making the statement, if you can't really forgive, it's going to interrupt the bond that we have of ministry. And he begins in verse 23. There uh, salute thee Epaphras, 
Now, we don't know a lot about Epaphras. We do know that he was probably a convert under Paul's leadership. He helped start churches in Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. Also, in verse 24, the name Marcus. Now, we, we don't use the word Marcus today in society. We say Mark. And he's talking about the gospel of Mark, the author of that gospel. You know, Mark was the cousin of Barnabas. He was much improved at the time of this writing in this letter. But if you go back in Acts chapter 15, Mark was very weak at times in his spiritual walk. Mark also didn't like the difficulty that he had to go through. And actually they wanted to bring Mark back into the fold for ministry. And Paul finally said basically, enough's enough, let him go. Let him go. He's not doing us any good. Let him go. But we see Mark came full circle. At the end of Paul's life, he wrote to Timothy. And this is kind of one of those things we pass through. But he said, Timothy, send Mark to me because he's so useful. At one time in his life, Mark was not as useful as he could have been. And we can all under, we can understand that. We've all been there in our Christian lives where we really wasn't of no use to God. I mean, we don't like to say that, but we've been there. We've kind of went through the motions of life. God's kind of, we, we acknowledge God, but God is not working through us and in us and using us. We're just kind of there. And that's kind of the way Mark was. And when it got a little too hot in the oven, he got out, didn't want to have anything to do with it. But then as he, after he left, we see that he made that full circle. God brought him back to where he needed to be in that relationship with him. And now Paul is asking for him because he is useful. We can all relate to Mark. It's an amazing story. Also in verse 24, Aristarchus. Don't know a lot about this guy. But he was associated with the cities in Thessalonica and Ephesus. Another guy by the name of Demas. Not a lot's mentioned about him, but in Paul's letter to Timothy, he said this about Demas. Now, none of us here have anything written about us in the Bible as far as per se about our names. You know, Richard Grubb, blah, 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 blah. Thomas, blah, 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 blah. Charlie Green, blah, 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 blah. Smurf, blah, 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 blah. There, you know, none of us have that written down. Well, here was a guy named Demas. There's not a lot written down about him, but how would you like for this to be written about him? In Timothy's letter, Paul said this of Demas. Uh, of Demas he has forsaken me, having loved this present world. At one moment he was faithful, and then he turned his back. On serving God. Think about that. Mark was a word of hope. To me, Demas is a word of warning. It's awful easy to get off track in our relationship with God. Is it not? How many of us have been there? We've been faithful, we've been seeking, we've been searching, and the next thing you know, we're completely out of God's will. We can call it whatever it is, we can blame whoever we want to blame, but when it's all said and done, we have made the choice personally to not be obedient to God. Then he goes on to list the name of Luke. It says Lucas, we know him as Luke, the great physician. The Christian doctor, full of love. To me, if Philemon doesn't forgive, he can destroy the bonds of fellowship and ministry among that group of peers. When you hold a grudge, when you hold a grudge, you fracture the fellowship. Does that not happen in your families? How many of us have a family member that over time something happened and they've held a grudge or unforgiveness in their family for years after year after year after year and it got to the point nobody even remembers what it was all over but they see the effects of it. 
If that happens in your personal family, how much more so does it happen in our church family? I've seen God do some great things in churches, as you have too. But I've seen the devil do some bad things as well. And it usually deals with unforgiveness. Imagine what Philemon had to go through. He's reading this letter. The pressure's on. How did he respond? It doesn't really say. How did he respond? History tells us that about 50 years later, after this letter was written, the church of Ephesus called a new pastor. You know what that new pastor's name was? Onesimus. Think about that. We're not 100% certain that it's the same guy. But with a name like that, I'm sure it wasn't popular. But that teaches us how God can affect those around us. It teaches us how grace can be demonstrated in our lives for good, but also a lack of grace can be used for bad. Now, I believe God is big enough that he could have got Onesimus to that church anyway. But what a teaching moment for Onesimus when Philemon forgave. I don't know what it was like that day, but I can see Philemon reading that letter. And he looks up, Onesimus, man, you know. It, you know how the look when they've been caught doing something, you know, and didn't want to have to do this? I can just imagine Philemon thinking through his mind about how God's intervened through the past in his life. How God had forgave him for so many things. Who was he not to forgive this runaway slave? And I think God used that relationship to prepare Onesimus for a later appointment in ministry. Think about that. Think about that. You say, well, Mike, that happened a long time ago. Yeah, it did. But I'm also reminded of a young lady not too many years ago whose parents were tortured and killed by the very people God had led them to ministry. This precious daughter could have held on to anger and bitterness and the world would have said, you have every right to. Probably would have been some Christians who would have said, you have every right to. But God says, you don't have a right at all. The only choice you really have is to be obedient to me. That's how grace motivates us. Ezekiel says this, the McNutt version. I can take that stone, that hard stone that is in your heart. I can remove it and I can make your heart live. That's what grace does. It's amazing. I encourage you to try it. As we stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Today, I don't know what God has spoken to you about or what you're struggling with, but I do know this. He's the only one who can help. He's the only one who can provide peace when you're broken. He's the only one who can help you when you're locked down. Today, are you obedient to the Father? Or are you kind of like Mark? Once you were right on the front lines of doing ministry, then through life events, you took a detour. 
almost as if you're not walking with him anymore, you're not being led by him, you're not searching. But yet God still pursues us. What a great tribute to God's grace is more. Came full circle. To be used of the Father. We've all been there. Many of us may be like things. Right there. Being a big Then we turn our backs on it. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that demons came back. God's grace to come to you. Father, help us to be obedient to you. This very day, we allow you to work in our hearts and our lives as we wish to. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we begin to sing, maybe you need to step away and come and work. about Scott and the opportunity uh, that's been presented over there and also with some churches here to help plant a church uh, in the Scottish Highlands. They have no really Bible voice 
at the present time in this town. And uh, so he's going to be here next Sunday evening kind of talking about it and answering questions, jot questions down if you got them, and he'll be more than glad to answer anything. Also, there's a, a pamphlet in your flyer or in your bulletin about a tabletop shower for Mark and Verna. Also, a couple of sign-up lists uh, in the back. If you're not on the one call list, we've been announcing this for a couple months, uh, and you'd like to be on the one call list where they send out the updates as far as uh, prayer requests, events. For instance, that let's say we get snow this afternoon and we need to cancel service, we'll put it out on the one call and you'll receive that call. Uh, if you would like to have that, uh, put your name and number on the information on the back. Also, a mission trip to Oceana uh, coming up on March 23rd through the 25th. Uh, we have almost 30, I think, signed up. So uh, Miss Judy is actually going to be kind of our team leader uh, over that trip. Uh, if you have questions about the trip or anything like that, you can see her or ask her about that. We'll uh, mostly leave on a Friday afternoon uh, and then minister there with Jim and Grace on Saturday, spend worship with, with, with them on Sunday morning, and then drive back that afternoon on Sunday. Also, for those that have signed up uh, for Experiencing God, remember your classes start this week. So uh, if you got questions, you already should know whose group you're in. If by chance God has been wearing you out, and you've not signed up for experiencing God, but you know God is dealing with you about it. See me today. I can get you in a group. We've got a few slots open, and I can get you a book so you can get started. But uh, today you need to do that. Let me know. Uh, all right. Thank you all for being here today. Hope you all have a great day. Uh, I know everybody's still kind of sick and snotting and fluing and all that instead of hugging. Elbow bump, 75 people as you leave. All right, thank you and God bless.